gentlemen and welcome once again to the Fox Valley Voice streaming live on YouTube. My name is Jaime Gutierrez and joining me in the studio to my left, your right, the one, the only, Eric Peter Schwartz. Howdy. Hey Eric, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's good to see you again. You too. As um, as I mentioned on, the, uh, on our promo here on Facebook that uh, you and I became acquainted approximately 13 years ago. Yep. And uh, and I haven't seen you since, but that was my fault. <clears throat> well, I mean, it wasn't anybody's fault. You just, I don't think you were very comfortable with, you had a pretty busy schedule, if I remember correctly. Um, you know what? Now that I have kids, no. <laughs> I, but no. it felt busy then. It yeah. felt busy. I don't know what I was doing with myself at that point, but uh, yeah, once you have kids, and you have kids as well, right? Yeah, so. actually, uh, we when you were in the group, you know, my wife was pregnant, and you left just just about the time we had our son. So okay, and you didn't think that was suspicious? No, that no, I, no, no. <laughs> I'm I'm blind to things like that. Usually, okay, so. yeah, well, you got nothing to worry about there. Yeah. But um, yeah, so for those of you who who may not have have read the promo, um, I uh, I tried out for uh, gag reflex. Yep. And uh, you guys had been together for a while before that, too. Yeah. When did you start up? The, the group actually started in 1993, and I didn't 93. join until 95. Okay. Um, and you uh, And then you I came along in 2000, so that was five years later. Yeah, we were having uh, we were having people falling away having babies, so we just we needed a new cast. Uh, we need, needed new people in the cast, and, and you... We took three people from uh, from your audition. It was you and Marla Paris, who is still with the group. Wow! And uh, hi, Marla. Uh, yeah, and she she made a she posted a comment on Facebook about it. Um, and then uh, um, so there were three of you. <laughs> She's going to kill me, but uh, uh, Marianne, that was her name, uh, was the third. And uh, I always thought of you as as one of the one of the ones that got away because you in the brief time you were there you managed you you did a, you did make an appearance you were on our internet radio show you're in one episode of that because you wrote two of these um I'm not a doctor but I did sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last the night Holiday Inn Express yeah uh, cuz that's when those were first big yeah yeah and those were funny we did them on stage and uh and you got credit and everything but you actually appeared in the in the internet radio show in one episode and then you you actually gave us the title for that year's New Year's show, which was Recount Dracula. Yes, Recount Dracula or Chad, Chad Taylor. Taylor. Yes, yeah, just during the hanging Chad. <laughs> yeah, right after Al Gore uh, uh, had the presidency uh, st- stolen away from him. I mean, oh, see now now this is going to be the it just got just political, because, huh? Just because of that, this is going to be the most viewed YouTube video you've ever done. <laughs> oh gosh. So, uh, so yeah. So, w- what should we talk about? I mean, perhaps maybe you should catch me up on what you've been doing for the past thirteen years. Well, for thirteen years, well, you know, we did gag really solidly, actually, right after you left in two thousand uh, and one. <clears throat> excuse me, in two thousand one, we did a, a big tour and put out a live album and called the Viagra Monologues. And uh, for those who don't know, Gag Reflex was a sketch comedy group, and it was. Uh, uh, all scripted, and, and we went really sort of hard at it for about five years. We, we did uh, we did 2001, 2002. We toured up into Wisconsin, and not huge crowds, but hey, we played in another state. That was like the big thing yeah. for us. We're like, we're in Wisconsin, woo! You know, we played at a place <laughs> called the Electric Earth in, in in Madison, which is a great little venue, and uh, and then. Uh, it started to slow down. We got some more cast members in, and, and, and really about 2006, 2007 was when it finally kind of slowed down. And, and I, I honestly, I kind of burned out, and I went to the group, and I'm like, we need to take a little bit of a break. And that six months suddenly became three years. Yeah. And then we did a show in 2009, which was a best of show. And uh, uh, that was the last one we've done. So it's we've just all kind of gone, you know, I'm I started doing all sorts of YouTube and... <clears throat> writing I had short films I wrote that like went to festivals and things and is that right yeah and uh, and directing other things and, and stage productions and Steve and I Steve Lord and I have both had plays published and things like that so 
I'm, we're, we're still technically an entity. Um, and we've talked, we've discussed, uh, members of us have discussed, let's do another show. But my stipulation is if we do new sketches, it, they have to be age appropriate because we're all, uh, the youngest members are pushing 40 and the rest of us are, I'm over 40. Every, other people are in their fifties. I mean, yeah. it's like, it's gotta be, you can't have first date sketches. So anymore. yeah, we're not going to do any high school. No. <laughs> No, uh, you know we did it in this best of show. We had a we had a sketch with the youngest member, a guy named Will, who's in his twenties, was playing the husband of a woman who was in her fifties, talking about their uh, their sexual the, fantasies, <laughs> and it was, it, that, it was it was a little creepy. It was a little, it was a little creepy. Okay, I mean, and I I understand that it's supposed to be comedy, but yeah. if it's more creepy than funny, then <laughs> we're we're pushing the the bounds of suspension of disbelief quite a bit uh, with with some of them. You know, so now if it's going to be a first date, they have to be like widowers. <laughs> you know, starting over. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, you know what? Maybe we should think about doing that because um, that would be the only way that I could get on a stage is if if it was with the the group because I'm grandfathered in, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm no, still you're, technically you're a member. You're technically the- a member. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, this is the, you know, technically this was the 20th year and in, in for our 10th year, we like blew it out. We did a big tour. We had a great big like reunion show with old okay. numbers and things. And um, I, you know, now that we have the tools where we could have found most of those people, you know, because there wasn't Facebook back then, you know, mm-hmm. we had to like, we were using Hotbot to find, you know, old, old members and news articles, um, you know, and we didn't do anything this year, you know, it was just sort of a, huh. you know. <laughs> It's never too late. No, it's never. I'm. I'm just figuring we'll just do the 25th in five years. Okay, that'll give me enough time to to practice. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay, so gag reflex, and then um, what else would you say? Now, you, you, we just mentioned the kids. How old? Is, so your oldest child? Yeah, my only. Yeah. Your only child? Yeah. Is how old? He's 12. He's going to be 13 in December. Is this the young man that is featured in a lot of your videos? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, he's he's very good. He he's he's disturbingly good. He's very he good. Yeah. Um, it started leading me to to believe that perhaps you just had a child because you wanted a co-star. <laughs> Is that was that your thinking? You know what? Actually, my thinking was I really don't want this kid to try to follow any artistic dreams. I never pushed him away from it, <laughs> but because you know I I know the, sort of the pitfalls of that. You know uh, the broken dreams. And yes. I was like, you sure you don't want to be like a cop or <laughs> you know, something like that? How about a butcher? <laughs> but a butcher, oh, man, it'd be great to have a butcher in the family, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, you got all your birthdays and your and your Christmas presents taken care of. There right we there. go. Here you go, Pop. Here's a border house. Um, but he has just, he's got a knack for music that that is just, I mean, he'll sit down at the piano and just work out video game music. Just boom. And start playing like the music from Doom. And by the way, he's totally into like old school video games. Okay, he's such a hipster. Castle and, Wolfenstein. Uh, yes, yeah, he loves <laughs> Castle Wolfenstein. We've got we've got it on we've got it on the Xbox. We we downloaded the old one. Oh jeez, uh, Wolfenstein 3D. Not he's never played the the original where you were looking down on the map and, and right. it was like uh, the old computer one. But uh, that and Doom and yeah, he's all he's all about that. But. He's surprisingly good at mm-hmm. what he does, and he's done stage work now too. Like, oh yeah, and yeah, he was uh, he played young Ebenezer in in the Christmas Carol last year, and and so it was like nothing. You know, my wife and I both performers, and he was around it all the time. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. You know, it was just sort of you know, it, it just rubbed off. Exactly. But that's good though, because that's that's the right way to do it. You're not a crazy stage parent. No. That's you know cracking the whip and and forcing them out there, throwing them out on stage. You know, I mean. If if children see you do something or anything, it doesn't have to be music or, 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 or theater. It could be anything. If they see you doing something and they see you enjoying it, you know, and that you're passionate about it, you know, right. that's obviously going to have a huge effect. He wants to take over Gag Reflex someday. Like, yeah. I, I keep talking about how, you know, he's like, are you guys ever going to do Gag Reflexing? Because he's just discovered, like, uh, all the old videotapes and, and, and the radio show he's got on his, his little MP3 player now. Which are probably not appropriate for his age, but I don't care. You know, it's all right. Um, <laughs> you know, I was listening to Andrew Dice Clay when I was a youngster. Yeah, yeah. I, I figured he, you know, he's he's so into stand up and you know, like Louis C.K. and 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 George Carlin, 
we don't let him watch it by himself. You know, we need to be around yeah, him. Sometimes you have to provide some context. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But those are guys who, philosophy-wise, I don't mind him oh, listening yeah. to. You know, Carlin says a lot of great things. Yeah, they're not just spouting hatred and violence. They're, yeah. They're, you know, yeah, their philosophy is sound. It's just their delivery that's a little rough sometimes. Right, exactly. And, you know, and, and he's he's become so he's become so astute with, uh, uh, um, like, his, his viewing habits on that that, like, he'll look at, uh, who was the, the big comedian about, about seven, eight years ago? I can't think of his name. The one, it was, he was huge on MySpace. Oh, gee. Um. <laughs> I know. Never mind. <laughs> anyway, but like. Was anything really huge on MySpace? Oh, yeah. There were a couple of people. You know, Bob Saget was gigantic on, on MySpace. Really? Um, I, I think I still have five MySpace accounts for different projects. <laughs> As you were, you, were, you were saying before we went on, I'm, yeah, I'm you, all over. Um, there are several links on your homepage. A lot. Yeah, there's a lot. And th- those are just the ones that I felt like keeping current. You know, um, when we when I was, you know, uh, 2000, 2001, when we started putting out MP3s as the comedy group, I I wanted to use the Internet like a touring circle, like like a, like a musician would where, you know, you put a little stuff over, play over here a few times and then you come back around and you play over here, you come back around. So I had stuff over on Amazon. I had it on, on all these different free MP3 sites, hoping that somebody would discover us and kind of lead them back to that. It never worked that way. But, no. But. It's like the day mp3.com just like up and disappeared, it was devastating because mm. we had like three years worth of like listens and downloads and fans and things. And they, whoever was, I think it was uh, eMusic came in and just wiped it out, just bought buried. it and got rid of it. Hmm. A little off topic there, sorry. No, no. I mean, <clears throat> everything's kind of on topic here. It, it, anything goes. You're the co host. Ah, that's true. So the Bears, huh? Jeez. Mm. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't even watch the game. Mm. I don't have time for sports anymore, which is weird because I used to be, that was my hobby was just sports, all sports, any sports. I watched every single sports center that was broadcast. Yeah. And then and then we had kids, and then that was it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, actually, it was, it was kind of a slow, a slow process, but, um, but eventually we got to a point where we canceled our cable. Really? Yeah. Cable TV. Now we still have internet, obviously. Right. And so you know we we watch stuff on Netflix, but but that's it. Yeah, that's I've heard that from a lot of people. We we still keep the television because um, you know there's just a few things really. You know, like well Doctor Who. If Doctor Who, I, I can't get that online. You know, you can't you can't okay you can not legally illegally. Um, we want to try and stay on the right side of the law if possible. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I have I have a friend who got on me terribly. You know, she like studied copyright law and she got on me terribly for a while. And so I started like doing everything above the board and paying for music. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, um, the, the switch for me was when it just became so easy. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can, I subscribe to Rhapsody. Um, and so if I need to listen to a new album, that's where I go. Um, I, we also have XM radio. So, and that's on all day long. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and you can you can also go to Amazon or iTunes or whatever, right? And it's just click and right. there you, there it is. So um, I think just the the ubiquitous nature of 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 legal downloads um, yeah. has made it not that big of a deal. And 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 now with the advent of things like Spotify and Pandora, you, oh yeah, you can discover things. Or if somebody says, "Hey, you got to hear this album," I can go to Spotify, listen to the entire album, and then say, "Yeah, no, you're wrong. I shouldn't hear that album." <laughs> you know, I'm not going to buy. And, and then other times, I'll be like, "I have to get this album." You know, I, I bet we were discussing Napster earlier, and uh, you know, back then, it was like a used record store for me. It was, it was. I was only looking for things that I couldn't find, and and or had once had and didn't have anymore, and didn't know how to get it. And so I would look up, you know, uh, you know odd singles you know, like like Brian Adams first single Let Me Take You Dancing where it was like a disco single from 1979 you know I was like I gotta mm-hmm. see if somebody has that so that's when I would download stuff and then it became easier and easier where I was like I can get full albums and I think once that happened that's when uh, like we said Metallica and everything that all that all started up and it just it actually tainted MP3s for a long time because you'd say MP3 to anybody who didn't know all they knew was it was bad yes you know um, even though there was plenty of legal stuff out there 
that you could get. And especially for independent artists who wanted you to hear their music, they would, you know, to this day, they still put stuff up. So since those days, uh, since mp3.com went away, like SoundClick is where I go for like independent artists or SoundClick or, uh, well, YouTube now. I mean, that's, you know, Mm -hmm. everybody has a, Andrew Dawn was saying on your, you have to have music videos now. Yeah. And you almost always have to have covers. Mm-hmm. Because people won't check out your, your your original stuff if they if they don't find you through like covers like uh, like Walk Off the Earth when they did uh, uh, somebody that I used to know when they were, all five of them were playing on the guitar right it wasn't their song but that's how I f- came to that song yeah now you, do you still get tagged for third party content if you do that um, I, again it, it comes down to whether or not YouTube has uh, you'll get tagged but it comes down to whether or not YouTube has a uh, has a deal with the music publisher. Hmm. Uh, if they don't, they'll actually strip the sound from your video, or uh, or they'll send it through. They'll they'll put they'll stick an ad on there so that uh, an ad uh, a link to iTunes so that you could buy the song. Mm-hmm. So I try not to do that on my music side. I, yeah, I, I'd like to. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about your music side because uh, you said earlier that that is the focus, your main focus right now. Lately. Yeah, yeah. So why, tell us about your music. Well, um, you know, I've done music this whole time. I just didn't uh, there's only been a few times that I, I tried to focus on it but it was e- the easiest thing for me to always walk away from because I never thought I was any good I was like eh you know and you know and with gag for a long time gag was my, my singular sort of laser focus you know everything was for that but even then I was writing music for gag I mean there's you know mm-hmm. parodies and funny songs and things in, involved in that and at the beginning of this year I said I wanted to do more music and and part of it was because I've spent so much time with Spigot um, or Gag or um, the theater in Geneva that I used to be on the board Geneva Underground Playhouse Um, I don't have to run anything past a committee I don't have to worry about a network or advertising or copyright I can just pick up my guitar and go to a bar to an open mic. I can and or set up shows and and I I can I'm free to create and do what I want basically. And it's that's it, it took a long time to realize. Oh, I can just grab my guitar and go. I don't have to sit here and ponder for a really long time and write a script and all these things. I can just go do it. Mm-hmm. You know. So I've got 20 years of songs that are, are just now finally reaching people's ears. And that's so that's. It's like, like Emily Dickinson. <laughs> well, okay, not that I'm like Emily Dickinson, but it's like you know, you know, um, so many artists. You know, you don't find out. They never know if people like their stuff because they never like put right. it out there in their lifetime. You know, and so I was. I said I've got to focus on this. And right now, I just I'm loving it. I'm I'm really loving going out and playing. And I've and people are really responding to it. You know, I've I've got uh, I've got a show at Culture Stock on Monday. Nice this, this coming Monday. Yeah, Frank Patterson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Frank and I have, have been talking. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. That was the first one that I set up. Actually, the first gig that I set up before I even started going to the open mics. I was like, okay, I'm going to send them an email. And in that email, I actually said, I'm terrified. I've I've never done this. You know, like never done anything solo. You know, I've done music shows before with. Like Steve, my from Gag Reflex, we did a, like a joke folk thing, and you know, and I had a little combo for a couple for for about a year. We did we did some shows, and um, but never solo, never just me and a guitar. Mm-hmm. And I said, but I said I'm going to do. And in this email, I'm like I'm like putting out my soul to to, to Frank in the culture stock, and I'm like, right. And then he writes back and says, you know what, Eric? On second thought, <laughs> you sound really needy. <laughs> <laughs> you sound you sound really no they they were great actually it took a little while for him to get back to me because I didn't write to the right people they had to like the email had to make their way through but then Frank mm-hmm. got back to me he's like yeah when do you want to do it and and then I started going to Elmer's up in Montgomery and doing the open mic there and uh, that was really where it sort of kicked in because I went to that very first open mic which is every Monday night Elmer's on Route Twenty Five in Montgomery mm-hmm. um, they. Uh, I was going to what I thought was just a regular open mic. And most open mics, you prepare two or three songs, you get up. And I figured I was going to be, like, the oldest guy. Because I used to do, like, Borders out in DeKalb when I lived out in DeKalb. And that's all like college students. Yeah, They're getting up and doing Dave Matthews covers, trying to woo the ladies. And I would get up and do my three, you know, sort of folky original songs. Uh, so I get to Elmer's, and I wound up doing my first night eight songs. They're like, keep going. <laughs> because... because uh, it, it was so unique for anybody to go in and start doing originals. Uh, or, you know, it's mostly a jam band there. Mostly people get up and they're, you know, they're doing Doobie Brothers and, and Fleetwood Mac. And it, it's it's cool. And, and I was like, 
I was one of the younger. I mean, we're you know, it's it's a it's an older crowd there. So I don't mean an old crowd. I mean, I, I'm in that crowd. But um, so it was great. And suddenly I was like, people were like, oh, yeah. You know, and I came back the next week and they're like, hey, do that song. Unfortunate, not unfortunately, but the, the song that like uh, that caught on is I did a gag reflex song. And that's the one they always want to hear. It's uh-huh. this cheesy love song where I've like taken this ridiculous lyrics and replaced words with different names of cheese that work in that same place. So, um, but you know, Elmer's just helped me kind of come out of my shell and, and I just, you know, now I, you know, did this like two hour charity thing on Saturday and I've got a, sh- I've got my first bar gig in Chicago. So it's, it's Is really, it right? yeah. Where, and, where, are you, where are you playing in the city? I'm playing a place called the Grace Street Tap on, uh, on the 6th of December. And that's going to be like a five hour gig. <laughs> that's like, let's like, wow. you know, like true bar, you know, I'll probably be able to take a lot of breaks and do two or three sets, but you know, yeah, it's like hopefully you know, from eight to one. I'm like, well, that's that's like real musician stuff. So, so it's it's just really. I ignored this part of my my life for a long time, and so it's just really been great, kind of coming out of the shell. Huh. So. Well, good for you, Eric. Thank you. I'm gonna have to make my way to one of those shows. And I I do want to say my album drops on Wednesday of next week, so. You just wanted to say that. I did. I did want to say my album drops. You know, no my folk singer drops. should ever say my album drops. So this is your debut album. Like you said, you've been doing music for 20 years, but this is your... Debut solo album. Debut solo album. We did three albums with Gag, and then, uh, but this is my, real, my true debut solo album. Okay. So. The, uh, the name of the album is Troubadourk. Troubadourk. That's me. <laughs> that, that's nice. I like that. Uh, available on the 30th of this month. Yep. And we can purchase that directly from you at uh, epschwartz.bandcamp.com. Yep. I will make sure that I include that uh, Thank you. link. Folk. So you're gonna you're, you describe it as a folky. Oh yeah. No, it's a, you know I finally sort like of a, embraced like, like a Peter Paul and Mary kind of a thing. Uh, I wouldn't go Peter Paul and Mary because you know th- my DNA still has Def Leppard in it. You know. <laughs> I mean. So it's. I mean. But it's. But it's folk. I mean. At the end of the day, folk music is. Um, telling stories and 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 sort of you know, mm-hmm. I, I guess it's just acoustic. Acoustic, but, yeah. But you know, I, I'm I'm much more interested in in being considered folk, you know. But I'm but I'm not you know I'm not doing protest songs at the moment, you know, <clears throat> not in the traditional way. Um, I would say it's. Uh, I was telling I was saying to somebody, you know, I I consider. You know, uh, the ingredients, everything I've ever heard from Def Leppard to Woody Guthrie. So it's like, it's all in there. Hmm. And uh, and the true dork part, I mean, that's who I am. I, you know, I, I can't pretend to be, you know, Merle Haggard getting into a fist fight with somebody. You know, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm the guy who finishes playing a song, goes home and plays Minecraft. I mean, that's that, that's who I am. I'm a true dork, you know. So that's that's my mission statement. We don't have to worry about you taking yourself too seriously then. Uh, no, no. Um, I mean, there's plenty of serious stuff. You know, I, last night I, I, I was at Elmer's and I played a, a song that uh, I haven't played since I got back because it's real. And I said, <clears throat> it's real navel gazing. And they're like, what the hell is navel gazing? And I'm like, it's navel gazing. You know, you stare, you know, that's the one thing that, you know, everybody thinks folk singers or singer songwriters are going to get up there and just going to be a morose. But if you watch a live performance of John Prine or, uh, uh, Richard Townsend or, you know, I mean, these people are entertaining on top of, you know, they're singing serious songs, but they're overall, you know, and there's still comedy in there. There's still, there's still humor in there. Like, uh, I've, I've got some songs in here that have some, there's a song in particular called Buttercream that's just a, like a naughty Delta Blues style song and it, it just cracks me up, you know. Um, so it's all serious. I, I don't take myself too seriously. I can't. I, I simply can't do it. It's, I don't know how to It's do not it. in your nature. It's not. Uh, and I think that's why I walked away from music so many times before because I thought you had to be. I didn't, uh, I didn't see that there, you know, there yeah. were other ways to go about this. Well, apparently you've never heard of They Might Be Giants. Oh, no, I've, I've heard of, and, and, and that's absolutely true. But I, you know, I always saw them as, that, that was something else. I didn't see them as, oh, I knew they were serious singer-songwriters, but you know, it's, They Might Be Giants. It's their thing. That's their, you know. But then you hear somebody like John Prine or Steve Goodman, who wrote really serious songs. And then, you know, John Prine turns around and does something like Frying Pan, which is about a guy who comes home, finds a note from his wife saying, make your own dinner. I've run off with the Fuller Brush Man. Yeah. 
And and then he starts singing about how next time he sees a salesman, he's going to kill him with a rock, you know, or knock him out, you know, with a, with a rock. And it's a funny song, you know. And so it was once I kind of like realized I don't need to kick away the what I'm known for, which is being, you know, funny. I mean, that's that's my thing. I don't have to kick that away. I can I can do more of a, a like a balanced performance of being entertaining and funny and and serious at the same time. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Deep, huh? <laughs> it is deep. I'm going to have to sit back and digest that for a little bit. But, you yeah. know, um, so your, your new album, you're doing shows. Yep. Um, Elmer's is your, would you say that's your, that's like your headquarters? You live down that way? Uh, yeah, I live right here in Aurora. Um, uh, actually, like halfway between here and, and, and Elmer's. I live okay. right in the middle of, of Aurora. And don't give us your address. No, no, no. But uh, but yeah no I uh, I I live nearby that was one of the reasons I chose Elmer's I wouldn't call it my headquarters but it's definitely the place that I've been going and kind of working stuff out so yeah I guess I guess headquarters works or at least like a home base yeah, yeah. um what else um now are you booking your own shows and stuff like yeah. that oh yeah okay. I'm just I'm using Reverb Nation uh, and they've got a great database where you can just I I, I pay five dollars a month for to have an electronic press kit. And I just sent it out to people. And that's how I got the Gray Street Tap. I just sent them a, a thing because they're, they're a little dive bar in Chicago. And that's actually a big thing now. I, I had no idea that being a dive bar was something you promoted now. Yeah, that's cool now. It's like a hipster thing. Yeah. And they, they said on their website they really promote original music. And I looked at pictures and it was all guys with acoustic guitars. And I thought, hey, okay. I'm a guy with an acoustic <laughs> yeah. guitar. You know, um, and again, that that's that's different from any other time that I've ever played music. It was always coffee houses before. I've got to go for non-traditional right. or coffee houses because I'm not a bar performer. You know, mm. who's going to sit in a bar and listen to some guy sing a song about two people who fall in love during a game of Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> you know, which I do have that song. That is so. that's niche right there. Yeah, it is. It's very and and that's how I introduce it. I'm like, there was a lack of this. I you know somebody needed to write this song. It's the truth. You're just yeah. You're just filling the need. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I just I sent them uh, uh, an electronic electronic press kit. One of the big problems right now that I'm discovering, and it, you know, it's you know, I, I was spent so many years booking gigs for a comedy group and so many years doing stuff on YouTube, and so now I'm learning the pitfalls of this, which is a lot of places want you to bring your own audience. You know. Right. Oh yeah. And you have to draw. And that. Um, I read some really good articles where people are like, "That's really a disservice to the bar." If 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 the people booking that think that because you if you want to establish your place as a as a place of performance, build your own audience who will come and see anything, right? You know, because if if this one guy brings a hundred people, the next night the next performer might only bring twelve, but that's not necessarily their fault. You know, you you need to have people who are going to come to your right. establishment no matter what. It's like you have to cultivate the audience so that they exactly. say, "Oh, hey, it's um." It's Monday night. We have to go to, you know, wherever. Right. Because they're going to have some good stuff. Yeah, and see who's playing. Oh, who's playing? I don't know, but... Right. You know, they do a good job over there, so... Yeah. So, uh, and again, and I don't want to jump into this being, you know, well, you know, you guys are doing it wrong, you know, (laughs) because, you know... Yeah, I've, yeah. I've only been doing this again for four months. I've, so. I've played two shows. Let me tell you how it is. You know, uh, I do a lot of open bikes, and I, I really, uh, I think I know best. But, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I just had an exchange with with a um, a guy. He said, "How many can you draw? We like to have between twenty and 30. And this is in the north side of Chicago. I'm not going. My core audience is not going to. I might be able to get fifteen people to go out there. You know, if I beg. If you if you pay for the bus, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, now I've got family in Oak Park. They might come. Like they'll probably come to the Gray Street. Uh, um, but you know I'm building an audience now, so I need to you know yeah. go find where those people are. So, but do you feel pressure to come up with a whole busload of people? Um, I don't feel the the pressure because I, so far I had none of the places that I've I've booked have have are, have been like that. I've had this one that was like yeah. you know. And I said in my my response email, I understand if you're not going to book me, but the truth is, I'm just starting back out. You know, I haven't done this in five years, so um, so I I feel a little pressure, but right now not simply because they're all new. You know, uh, Culture Stock is the first one. I've got two shows booked at the the Bartlett Nature Center, which has a great little theater in it. You know, nice. Um, so that's like a non traditional, not bar or coffee house setting. It's a, it's a theater. Um, and then the Gray Street, I'd like to get some people too. 
Uh, so that's one that I'm definitely going to promote. But at the end of the day, if I don't bring them in, I mean, we haven't even discussed money, you know, with, uh, you know, at, at, at any, uh, any of these places, because to me, it's more about, I, I want to play for these people and see if they like me. If they like me, they can grab my flyer, they can go buy my uh, album, they can, you know, do whatever, and then start following me. So it, it's more about getting Twitter followers than it is actually, you know, mm-hmm. um, so, but yeah, I was already starting to promote the Gray Street thing with my, my family in Oak Park. You know, I, I, I'd like to get some people there because if I bring people with me and the response from their regular crowd is good, then they'll ask me back. And that's, yeah. so it's, it's all very new. The, book, the booking of these shows is all very new. So it, it's, it's strange. You got to kind of Google places that seem to play your kind of uh, music or, you know, I won't look at anything that's got like a hundred seats. I'll be like... I'll try to find a, a venue that's got oh they seat thirty I'll I'll see if they want they want me there yeah so stuff like that okay uh, let's talk let's talk about YouTube mm-hmm. if you don't mind sure because I need to um, I need some I need some guidance <laughs> <laughs> because you you are obviously a a, a YouTube star <laughs> I wouldn't say star. Um, I've got I've got a lot of people on there that I've I've met and that like spigots and um, tell tell me. I would say I'm a veteran now, which which yeah. is is strange because I could actually say you know back in the day when we started I, <laughs> exactly when when you be and be aware of who spigots is tell us about spigots the cat spigots the cat uh, is a uh, spigots is a uh, cat who talks he lives in my basement um and he's been doing a youtube show for three years now um and he's uh he's opinionated um and kind of dorky like me <laughs> actually it's strange how much he is uh spigots and i have started to blend it used to be much more of a distinct me and the character mm-hmm. And as you start to have to produce content over time, it just becomes, you know, Spigots is talking about all the same things. Spigots is your mouthpiece now. Exactly. Exactly. You know, Um, absolutely. I'm running out of RAM here, Eric. Oh, I'm sorry. Too many windows open. (laughs) Too many things uh, I'm a part of. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You're crashing my computer because I can't keep track of all of your internet properties. But, uh, but yeah, Spigots is a, you know, technically he's a puppet, but it, it's not, uh, I don't do the tongue in cheek thing where it's like, ah, you know, he's a puppet. And so does he really. No, no, he's a cat. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I would say, you know, my biggest influences in doing Spigots would be like, bad, things like that. Because it was like, that's sort of the humor I'm going for. It's family friendly. That That uh, is one thing that I noticed. Yeah. And probably mostly because your your son uh, features in many of the yeah. videos. Yeah, you know, actually, it was a, again, it was a conscious. You know, I, I created spigots for gag reflex. We used to do uh, spigots uh, on stage, and it, it wasn't family friendly. It was it was all scat humor and and uh, a lot of language. I mean, our our first song featured the f word. You know, our our, our first uh, spigot song that Steve and I did. And when I I did some research before I started the the channel because I I wanted to do something on YouTube. So I looked around and I thought. Uh, my favorite guy, and I don't know if everybody's seen him, is, is a guy named Wheezy Waiter, and he's he he does a daily, usually a daily show that's just really clever. It kind of uh, pretends to be a vlog, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like a hyper reality. You know, he's got clones and he's got all these things. Um, and so he was my inspiration, and he played everything clean. He did everything, for, and you know, gag reflex was not at all family friendly it was no. you know it was it was, it was adult was humor very mm-hmm. it was it was definitely our rate i mean we could clean it up when we needed to but it took some effort and so i i got rid of the a lot of the scat stuff i mean gas still pops up every once in a while <laughs> P- <laughs> pun absolutely intended uh, uh, but i just made it more sickly and i made him uh a bit of a drug abuser which is not really family friendly but i made it uh, he it was more of a mistake like he would mess up his own meds like he's an ancient cat I mean he's 28 years old which is crazy for a cat <laughs> um, and he and he you know so I um, I mean even the name Spigots comes from the fact that he couldn't control his bladder mm. that was the original sort of uh, okay. uh, character idea so I got rid of all that stuff and I said you know what if I make this more family friendly I, it expands my audience and I have I've gotten emails from Grandmothers who watch with their grandkids and stuff like that. So I, I like that. I prefer that. I, I don't. I don't. 
I'm not a person who like you know rallies against language or anything like that um, because I actually I I see great value in it quite yes. quite often. But uh, you're you're also limiting your audience when you do that. Yeah, absolutely, and. Um, and I also think that, you know, I, you know, I, I see the stuff that my son watches on YouTube because, you know, YouTube is like television for him. He'll, you know, he'll, yeah. he'll flop back and forth from YouTube to Netflix to TV and, and it's all just one big thing for him. Yeah. It, it, yeah. The, the channel, the, the, the medium doesn't matter. Yeah. It's, are you being entertained? Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people out there who, because of the freedom of YouTube and there's a lot of freedom. They don't take a lot of responsibility for the fact that at the end of the day they're a children's performer. So they think they're being more of an adult comedian, but their audience is a Nickelodeon audience, and so they're not taking any responsibility for the ideas and the and the the humor and the and the language. Um, I'm not again. I'm not going to name any names, but I mean, there's people I think who do it well. Like I think Smosh. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Smosh. They're one of the the biggest channels out there, and my son watches them all the time. They edit. I mean, they they edit out the language. They'll say things and bleep it. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the, you know, it, I mean, it's 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 juvenile humor at the end of the day, you know. And I, but they've kind of embraced it, and I think they take some responsibility for that. There are other people who just just let all the language fly and and all the ideas fly. And and now, are you saying that that's irresponsible to put that out there? I don't think it's irresponsible, but once you reach the point where you're making a lot of money doing it cultivating that audience and you keep doing the same thing because you know they like that and you stop doing the things they don't like kids are going to watch uh, those kids are going to watch um uh whatever they feel they shouldn't be oh yeah <laughs> you know that's just in kids nature absolutely so i don't think it's irresponsible but i th- i think you need to take it into account especially if you're making six seven figures off it wow you know um and there are people out there who um their core audience is 12 years old and their language is just and not that the kids aren't saying it. I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of those people. I don't, you know, but at the same time, take, take a little responsibility and, yeah. and, and, and try to say, I, look, I understand who my audience is. That's interesting that you say that because I'm thinking that if, if that's the type of, of entertainment that you want to put out there, that's the type of comedian you are or, 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 yeah. or whatever, even if you're a musician and your music has a lot of, you know, profanity in it. Yeah. Um, you know, if that's what you want to do and you put it out there, then who are you to, who are you to say you should be watching this or you shouldn't be watching this? No. Yeah. You know, but I also understand what you're saying. If you know for a fact that there is a certain type of person watching your show. Yeah. And they're minors. Yeah. And you do it on purpose, then I can, I can kind of sort of see that. But how do you? I don't, it's just a, it seems like it's a really tough line to draw. Oh no, I absolutely I, I agree with that, and I and I I am not one to to censor. I in fact I hate censorship. I, I think it's I think it's ridiculous, and I think any censorship that comes should come from you. Yeah, and that and and I think yeah, or take, your parents. Or, so that's what I'm no, thinking. No, is that's that true. That's absolutely. We true. try to tell my son not to watch YouTube unless we're around because yeah. it only takes one click. Yeah, and on the wrong video, <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> and you know it's all all hell breaks loose. So um, we we try to monitor that as much as we can. Um, it's it's hard to do. Yeah, but but again, th- the only issue that I I really take is is when at the end of the day, the you're making that much money and you know who your audience is. Yeah, if yeah. you know that. Uh, that the majority of your audience, because you've met them, you've gone to like VidCon or the big conventions, and you've met your audience, and you see, oh, they're all thirteen-year-old girls, you know, you see that. Um, why aren't you? Are you are you continuing to do your your style and material because that's what the kids want to watch, and you're you're cultivating yeah, it well, again? But you're right. It, it's a, it's a it's a. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kick the mic. Oh God, I'm so unprofessional. Um, uh. Right. But that's uh, uh, it is a it is a hard line. And it's just that was the reason I I did speak the way I did, which was I don't want to deal with that because at the end of the day he's a, a puppet and and I I get irritated because I, it shows a lack of creativity if if the only thing you do with a cute fuzzy animal is make him swear. Right. Yeah. Because that's just 
that's l- the low hanging fruit. Exactly. Yeah. And and I didn't want to do that. And and actually, I think I've suffered for that. You, I was saying upstairs, you know, spigots is kind of a niche thing. And I think if I had started out with spigots as a foul mouthed, you know, yeah. pooping like puppet, the, like the dog on Conan O'Brien, right? The, the uh, triumph. Yeah. Triumph, exactly. The insult comic dog. No. I think he's fantastic because <laughs> I actually think he's. Um, but if you know, spigots does videos about. Schrodinger's cat, you know he yes. he takes on topics that a lot of people just very intellectual. Yeah, uh, yes and no. I mean, there there are some that are and some that aren't. But um, you know, like if, ca- if I, like I, cat with a mustache was very intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, let me stop for a second. Yeah. Um, so I went back and I watched several of the Spigas videos, yeah. and. I'd like to say that I didn't have any expectations going in because I, I try to have an open mind. But um, I, I want to say that I think going in, I, I sold it a little short. I went in thinking, okay, I'm going to check this out. Um, it's probably not going to be all that great. Yeah. And I, I, it pains me to, to admit no, no, that it's... to your face, um, you know, because it's, you know, it's a cat. It's a cat and... And how funny is that going to be? And I swear to you, um, I was watching this on the uh, on the on the tablet last night after my wife went to bed, and I think I woke her up a couple of times because I was actually laughing out loud. Oh, great! So, which, which great? I'm glad you woke your wife. Which yes, <laughs> Sorry. So she's going to have a few words with you. <laughs> that's fine. I um, no, but uh, that's it. Seems like that's rare for me lately to actually like. Usually, if I see something funny on television. It's kind of like a broad humor, and you just go, hmm, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, that was funny. Yeah. But then, you know, and I was watching Spigots last night, and I actually had, like, a guffaw. Oh, that's, which, I, yes. I love a guffaw. So it was guffaw-inducing. Um, so, yeah, the, the mustache thing was funny, and um, <laughs> I really liked the one that you did, with, that Spigots did with uh, with your son, the, uh, the freeze frame, the laugh in the freeze <laughs> frame. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, I, that's one of my favorites. Especially the Breaking Bad one. The Breaking Bad one, when I made spigots look like Heisenberg. That uh, that cracked me up. You know, that I, I, I would love to tell you that that was a unique story, but I've heard that from so many people who were like, you know what, I didn't like him at first, but I watched a couple more, and now I can't get enough of him. And, and I think that's what it is. I think, you know, everybody has an expectation going in, and most people don't even go in because they have that expectation. And uh, I, I own that. I, I get that, you know. Um, but you, know, I mean, you know, but I've been making people laugh for so long. I've been doing this 25 years, so I know it's funny. Um, but I'm always happy when I find out people also think it's funny, you know, because mm-hmm. I, you know, it's a talking cat. I know it's weird. And the still pictures, you know, the the the, uh, the thumbnails for your videos, that's a creepy looking cat. He's like E.T. You don't think he's cute and adorable until you've seen it. You right. Know? Mm-hmm. I'm glad I was able to make you go fall. <laughs> Yo. So, uh. Anyway, we encourage you to check out Spigots the Cat because it is it is truly funny, and and most of them are like I said earlier. You, it seems like if you can keep your YouTube videos under four minutes, that's kind of the magical spot, right? Yeah, it seems to be. Um, Which I've completely just done away with. Yeah, but this I wouldn't call this a, a YouTube video. You know what I mean? It, it's not a video designed for uh, sort of viral sharing. I mean, that's the sweet spot is four minutes because that's what your average uh, student between classes can watch on a, on a phone. And it's the, the average time that people can get away with watching YouTube videos in a cubicle. Yeah. You know, and I, I believe that that's why four minutes is the magic number, you know, because those same kids will go and watch, you know, half hour SpongeBob. They'll, you know, oh, yeah. and the adults will watch Downton Abbey. So. Uh, but I wouldn't consider this, uh, this is a video on YouTube, but I wouldn't consider this a, a YouTube video. And, and I, I mean that in the best way, actually, because to me, this is, you're using YouTube the way I think most people do, which is as a hosting site. You're using it as, as a hosting site. Mm-hmm. People who sort of uh, go for the, the YouTube, it's, I, I have to call it a lifestyle. I mean, doing that, and, it, and it, it, it's something that, that I, I know friends of mine have found very daunting, and they've, you know, killed off characters you know they they had a show and they'd kill off character or they just stopped doing it they burn out after a while because it's you got to share this and you got to you got to go over to Google Plus and put it up and you got to put it on Twitter and Tumblr and you got to do this that's something you have to do and and the people who are professional YouTubers Wheezy Waiter 
Shane Dawson, Smosh, all these people have to do that, or hire, eventually they can hire people to do it. Right, but that's your distribution channel. Exactly, exactly. So this is you use this as a hosting for you know for for a different purpose. It's on YouTube, but but it's not designed to be a YouTube video. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, I mean, I have so often, I would say more times, I've done three hundred and. 20 some videos or something like that and I would say maybe 20% of them are 4 minutes or under. I've worked at it the, this last 6 months uh, when I've done videos. It, my video output has kind of trailed off a little bit more recently um, and I, I have a theory about that too but um, but I, before that I was working real hard to keep it condensed because I'd say in 2011, 2012 when I was sort of at my production peak, I was doing seven, eight minute videos. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, my videos get 100 views, uh, 150 at best. I've got a few that are in the thousands. There's, there's one video in particular. Uh, it's called Distraction Jackson. And it's one of the laziest videos I ever made. It was a Sunday night video. And I thought, you know what? I don't feel like editing. So all I did was I, I shot spigots, and then the whole thing was narration inside his head. That was the whole thing. And it was him trying to write the script for tonight. You know, it was, it was sort of a, it was a meta. It was so meta. Okay. <clears throat> but it wound up getting 13,000 views. Whoa. Here's why. Back then, I would number the episodes. So the video title was Spigots the Cat, number 65. Or Spigots, Spigots the Cat, 65, Distraction Jackson. Cat 65, or whatever it was, is a Middle Eastern porn site. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I've got, I've, got, I've got 25 comments from people I know that always watch my videos. You know, uh-huh. They're my friends uh, on YouTube. Um, and 10,000 videos in, in like two weeks. I'm like, how? You know? And I wasn't monetizing then. This would have been a great time to be monetizing. So I started looking into it because I'm like, th- there's something wrong here, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, no, 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 this is this is not right. So I started like looking around, and everything was coming from mobile sites from India and Pakistan. <laughs> I'm huge in India. I, I was, yeah, I was like, I'm gigantic in India. This is fantastic, but there was no comments coming in, and and you you know, with YouTube, you can look up how long they're watching your video. You can actually see oh, they drop off after about 13 seconds. I'm like, okay, something's up. So I started like Googling and I eventually came across Cat65 and I was like, oh, okay, that's because the, and actually that's one of the reasons I started not numbering it anymore. And then I did, I did, I will admit I tried sticking that into the meta tags in some other videos and it didn't work. So I took it out. Um, but that, I thought that was funny because it's like, it's I'm seeing these numbers come. I'm like, it's a good video, but not my best, <laughs> you know. And you, you know, just happen to stumble <clears throat> upon the uh, the secret. Yeah, that's right. That's right. If you can accidentally be mistaken for porn, Middle Eastern porn. Middle Eastern porn, absolutely. Excellent. I'm gonna have to look into that. I thought Cat 65 was a was an Ethernet cable. It probably is. No. I don't know. Okay. Um, I can just I can just see these these people on their tablets and their their mobile going oh good another and then they click and they're right. like the hell is that oh get him off my, uh, my a little bit my disappointing computer. I, yeah, I, I would imagine, imagine. Yeah. a lot of anger but you know what I don't get a lot of hate I I, I don't um, uh, I've got nine hundred some subscribers out of those about a hundred actually watch which is typical you know uh, it's like wedding invitations you know you send out two hundred and fifty um, but I don't get hate. Um, I have the nicest. Well, you can't hate a cat. No, you can. You can. Oh, you can. Okay. And you can hate puppets. You know, I, I mean, before I started doing uh, spigots as a show, I took them on a couple of test runs onto Chat Roulette. Okay. Oh gosh. <laughs> this was after they'd actually started cleaning it up for the most part. But I, I took them out and I thought I want to see what people's reaction to the cat is. You know, and I had them talk. The best re- reactions were from people who were sitting on chat roulette high, <laughs> who were just like stoned and staring. There was one guy who like flipped out, you know. Uh, but then I would like suddenly Spigots is like in this room with all these teen girls who were like at a slumber party and decide they're going to get on chat roulette. And they called me. They're like, you, you know, this is kind of sick. This is kind of twisted. I said, just because I have a puppet, I- I'm, you know, and they're like, are you a pedo? And I'm like, just because of. 
you were just in a room, I'm pretty sure, with a guy with no pants on. Yeah. And you think the guy with the puppet is sick? I'm like, so so you can hate a cat. Then and more, kinda, or, moreover, you can hate a puppet. You know what? And, and that speaks a little bit to my concern lately with, um, I don't want to sound like angry old guy about, yeah. you know, complaining about the this generation, but... Um, it seems like that um, just in general that sensibilities are a little bit warped uh, as far as what what younger people think is acceptable or yeah. not. Yeah, I you know I, I and I'm sure every I mean this happens every generation, right? Mm-hmm. Like you always think that the youngsters are are going to take everyone to hell in a handbasket, but but really I think it's true this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <clears throat> I I in in some ways I agree. And in some ways, I, I think it's really it, – my son, uh, and I, I only use him because him and his immediate friends are, are, are just my, you know, test sample, my sample uh, group. Um, I'm amazed by what they think is funny. These, there's, this, there's this thing on YouTube called YouTube Poop. And what they do is they take. Have you seen that? No, seen? no. It has nothing to do with poop. It's just the name they use. Okay. And what they do is they take – Existing content. Uh, I've seen some really good ones with with Star Wars. I've seen uh, SpongeBob seems to be a big one, and it's just, it's like they throw this and they re-edit things. They re-edit them so they're saying different things. They they throw in images. They throw in like all these internet memes, and it it's coming at me so fast that I actually turn into my dad. What is this? You know, that that's where the line seems to have drawn for me. But my son thinks it's hilarious. It's like this fast paced thing that I just don't understand and they think is really funny and the one that actually bothers me is how easy it is to get a laugh by calling somebody a pedophile Tosh.0 does that all the time Mm. and at some point and and I do I feel like an old man why is that funny why is pedophilia funny and why aren't people suing you for slander I mean that's you know that's terrible but there's this pedo bear. Have you seen pedo bear? Uh, yeah, I've seen I it. don't know where he came from. I'm aware of him, but like he'll show up in things, and suddenly there's a rape joke, and I'm like, uh, uh, yeah, okay, that's that's funny. Now to talk to my son, he's like, I know rape is terrible. I don't think pedophilia is funny. That's funny. The bear, you know. And I'm like, right. So you see, there, there's a very distinct um, changing of sensibilities. There. Yeah, yeah. No, I and I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you completely. You know, I mean, but at the same time, if we look at the stuff we thought was funny, the stuff I produced in gag, you know, we we did in gag reflex. You know, I I wrote a sketch about a squirrel raping a dog. That was funny because I kept it a squirrel and a dog, and it was ridiculous. You're gonna get hate mail from from the dog lobby. That's now. fine. And then at the end of the sketch, they put the dog to sleep, and his guardian angel comes down and sings a song. I mean, it there was just about everything that <laughs> offensive in that, but. It, but you, I kept it so cartoon, and I think I think that's the thing is that they're so they're so far removed. You, you don't have to keep things. It's like the violence in Tom and Jerry, okay. because love Tom and Jerry. It's my I favorite. love Tom and Jerry. Tom and Jerry too. People who were really sensitive to violence hated Tom and Jerry, but most everybody understood that Tom and Jerry and Warner Brothers were violent, but they weren't real violence. And I think that real violence has gotten so cartoony that you know. We yeah. we now think of of rape and pedophilia as violence, and kids don't. They they've separated that. They're like, you know, they're the first ones to tell you if if some guy is like creepy and stalkery, and they'll tell you that. Hmm. But then they'll laugh at pedo bear, and and that and and that that change is is absolutely, and it, and it goes back again to to what I was saying, which is, <coughs> excuse, I'm sorry, why why uh, why are we promoting that as something that's funny, and why are there people. That same sensibility is is now cropping up on Adult Swim, and it's it's cropping up on Comedy Central. I sound I'm starting to sound like Tipper Gore. <laughs> I hate that about myself that I that I'm sitting here going, oh, think about the children. I, I'm not actually. I'm actually just thinking about good taste. But like, uh, what's that show on Comedy Central? Brickleberry. The ads. The ads have like rape and pedophilia jokes in the ads. Right, so that's what they're using to draw you in to, to watch right, the show. Right, because they're If you want more of this... Right. You know, um, even Family Guy, which was once, you know, cutting edge, has pulled back from that sort of thing. Hmm. You know, they, they still do a little bit of it. I mean, 
to me, the the old guy on Family Guy who's who, who's always after Chris, and he's he's quite obviously uh, some sort of you know sick pedophile. Uh, I think that's funny. My wife doesn't. I think the way they do it is funny because he never succeeds. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think, but that softens the wall, and suddenly, you know, oh, you know, pedo bear. I just I just saw this this one where they re-edited uh, Chamber of Secrets with Harry Potter. It's really well done. It's very funny. Um, but when the snake comes out at the end, the 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 uh, basilisk comes out. They've taken the pedo bear and put it over the basilisk. So as <laughs> Harry's running, there's this giant pedo bear like f- f- fuzzy out of frame coming in, and then it cuts. It says place rape scene here, and I laughed because it was well done. But at the same time, I was like, that really shouldn't be funny. But that I, I think we, you know, our generation softened that wall by thinking these things are acceptable, and I think that's just the way things go. I, I don't want to squash it because to me that's squashing creativity and it's squashing personal. But I want to, I really want to teach the kids. That's really not that good. There's better stuff out there. Yeah, if that makes any sense. I want to change the world. Honey. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're doing it right now. <laughs> One People YouTube are gonna watch this and think that I'm like th- that I'm like this. Oh God, he, you're, he's just you're, he's so family friendly you're and gosh. ultra conservative. Not at all. You would not believe the things I've written and said. <laughs> Last night I, I sang a song. I had I opened this. I, I won't use any of the language here because I don't feel it's appropriate. But I said, "How do you feel about the F word?" Because the song has the F word in in the chorus, and it's kind of a. It was a song we used to do in Gag Reflex at the end of the show, and I thought I, I changed it up a little bit, made it about you know boot, booting somebody to the curb at the end of a bad date. So I'm not at all opposed to these things. I just think you need to know your audience, and and when that's all that's available, and that's the thing yeah. you're advertising, I just think it, it starts to get. You can. So what you're saying is you can be dirty, but just be tastefully dirty. Be clever. That's all I want. Clever. Yes, be, that's good. Be clever. I don't even think the song I was singing was clever. But, you know, I, the, the one thing that I've held back from my son for a really long time, and we've we've only just pushed the door open a little bit, was South Park. Mm-hmm. Because while I think South Park is really good satire, sometimes it's just, it, it's too much for me. Like It's over the top, definitely. Um, they actually lost me as a regular viewer for Mr. Hankey, and I felt like a complete prude for thinking Mr. Hankey was too far. That was I thought Mr. Hankey was hilarious. I thought the idea was funny, but like when he would smudge things, I was like, oh, that was like the thing that was like, no, no, no. Okay, well, you know? so you were more grossed out than anything. Yeah, than anything. Okay. And, and that was like the very first time that I started feeling, am, am I getting a little too old for some of this stuff? <laughs> You know, um, I you know South Park movie is genius. I love the South Park movie, and and every time I watch South Park, there are always wonderful ideas that I watch in it. But that's one of the things that I've had to kind of you know. Dance. My my son is like, can I watch South Park? I'm like, Ugh. all right, we'll watch a couple, but we'll be here. But like Beavis and Butthead now, Beavis and Butthead is almost family friendly at this point. Oh yeah, if you watch old Beavis and Butthead, the things right. that they railed on back then, it, it's crazy. Or there was a when the Simpsons first became popular, there was a big backlash against the Simpsons. Yeah. They wouldn't even let you wear Bart Simpson shirts to yeah, school. Yeah, because Bart Simpson talked back to his parents. Right. That's the and worst. And he thing. didn't like school. Yeah. Wow. I didn't. I don't know any other kids who. Yeah. I, yeah. Were mouthy and didn't like school. I didn't. You know. I I remember that. I remember when that first uh, that first Christmas special went out and everybody came. You know, was was doing Bart Simpson. After that. And the parents were, oh, I'm thinking, parents can't even keep up now because it, it's constantly upping. And I think that's what it is. I think it's it's constantly upping the. It's like an arms race, yeah. Yeah, yes. Fall Out Boy was absolutely correct. <laughs> this ain't a scene. <laughs> this ain't a scene. It's an arms race. But it, I think it goes back to Miley Cyrus in some ways, the, this argument about. The, oh, that, that I know. But. I got so tired of people railing on it because I thought, well, first of all, you're giving her exactly what they want. I thought that performance wound up being genius because everybody was talking about it. Yeah, that's and, a nice piece of PR right there. Yeah, but then I went, I said, you know, all you have to do is take Miley Cyrus out and put in Madonna mm-hmm. when she did Like a Virgin at the MTV Video Music yeah. Awards and she's writhing around. And our parents were like, oh, my God. You know, it's it's all, you got to keep upping the, the game. And at some right. point, it's going to reach this tipping point. But I think that, that each generation gets to a point where they themselves just kind of roll it all back and and kind of go back and say, you know, that was too far. And they, they start looking for something more 
less juvenile, I think, I think at the end of the day. At least I hope. I hope so, too, because um, I think your outlook on it is a little more optimistic than mine. I think I think the uh, the slope has gotten slipperier, and I don't think there's any way back. I I I think there's a way back. Simply, you because know what it is? It's it's the fact that there are direct channels. You don't have to. There is no filter anymore. Yeah. You don't have to go through a network or even a cable company. You know, it's just direct from the sick people to your eyes. You know, yeah. you don't and. That's a really good point. I, that's that. That's like a frightening phrase from the sick people to your eyes, and that's that's true. That's very true. And I would love to put it all down on on parents. As a parent, I can't, because in all honesty, it should be the parent's job. But at some point, you can't. You know, my parents couldn't control me. I went over to my friend's no. house to watch yeah. the R-rated movies. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. And and so. I, I think all I, we can really we can sit here and we can talk about it, but I think the only thing we can really do is like spigots, like what I tried to do, which was I'm just not going to do that, you know. And if they come to me, they come to me, and plenty have. And you know, I've got you know, I've got plenty of kids Danny's age who love spigots, you know, my, my son Danny, um, who loves spigots, um, but also like this other stuff. And and so really, all I can do is, is sort of act on myself. I know that sounds like all magnanimous and pragmatic and all those big words that I don't really know what they mean. <laughs> um, but all I all we can do is try to show them the better stuff, which might not actually be better. Yeah. It's just the stuff that we find acceptable and say, you know, there's this also. Because my son, well, I told you, Louis C.K. and George Carlin are huge influences on his life because he loves stand-up comedy. He will also listen to Jonathan Winters and Bill Cosby and Bob Newhart. He knows those people and their routines right. by heart as much as they do he does. And that's our job as parents is to is to make sure that those voices get in there yeah. along with, you know, exactly. the SpongeBob's and the South Parks and yeah. all that. And I like SpongeBob. I th- you know, I think SpongeBob mm-hmm. is, you know, it goes, you know, it's like Ren and Stimpy. You know, oh, the funny thing about Ren, love and Stimpy, Ren and Stimpy. But when it came back, when they brought it back on Spike, it was awful. Because yeah. there was no Nickelodeon filter. Well, and also, um, John Chris Felusi was not involved with the. With when he it, came, was he? when he came when he brought it back, it was him that brought it back, and the very first one I watched. But didn't they try to do it without him? Well, they did on Nickelodeon. He got booted after the first season and a half or two seasons yeah. on Nickelodeon, and, and they, they weren't that good. Those were bad. Those were bad. But when he brought it back on Spike in the early aughts, um, as the Ren and Stimpy adult party cartoon. There was no filter, and suddenly you had uh, Ren and Stimpy, and they're doing pitcher and catcher jokes about oh. who's which. Right. And I watched it, and I, I literally hated it. I seriously turned it off and never watched it again. I was like, this is no longer funny to me, because right. there was something... Uh, I mean, Don't Whiz on the Electric Fence is funny. Yes. You know? It wasn't just because I was... Because Ren and Stimpy came out when I was 20 years old. I wasn't a kid. Mm-hmm. But that was funny, and and because a certain amount of control forced you to to be more clever and and work to get around. It's like like any television right. or or movies during the the big censorship era. They had to. I can't believe I'm promoting censorship. I'm really not. I'm really not. That's the main just, takeaway from this show: is you just realized today that you are um, Eric is a Nazi. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know. Um, but it, there was just something. It was like it was like when when you can take the gloves off, and that's what YouTube does. YouTube and the internet allows you to take the gloves off, so that you've got nobody telling you what to do. Your instant reaction, uh, not your, or but a lot of people's instant reaction is, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and and as that increases, then television, uh, Comedy Central, Adult Swim have to, in order to compete with independent entertainment online, they have to take their gloves off. So you get shows like Brickleberry and workaholics which are funny or like it's always funny in philadelphia which is a very very funny show but even they have to amp things up because on the internet they can say and do this stuff you mm-hmm. know so i just i just think it almost breeds um less cleverness and and less having to think about how do i say this how do i do this where i can still get the point across and be naughty without just being blatant and and saying yeah, it and, and, and crude yeah Yep, I'm a complete Nazi. Well, well, I'm sorry, YouTube. I'm glad that we uh, we were able to <laughs> help you figure that out. I came out of the Nazi closet. 
<laughs> so um, we do. Uh, we got to wrap it up. We, yeah. We, we are in overtime right now. So um, what we want to do is make sure everyone knows where to find you. Your uh, your album is dropping next week. <laughs> On Wednesday, it's and called. If it, if it doesn't, I'm gonna have to take them to the doctor because they're gonna have to do something about that. Nah. <laughs> um, see, okay, clever without being crude. Okay, there we go. I got it. Uh, Troop Dork, uh, epschwartz.bandcamp.com, and uh, you can also find Spigots on YouTube. And uh, anything else we need to know? When are uh, we gonna get this um, this reunion show back on the road? Five years? Is that what we said? I, yeah, let's let's plan on the twenty fifth anniversary. Okay. Show. I'd say if you go to bwatersmedia.com, you can get a link to pretty much everything. My right. Twitter, my Facebook, everything. There. And we will have all of those links on the Fox Valley Voice for you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me, and, and thank you for letting me rail on uh, <laughs> dirty people and bad words. Yes, we we turned out to be a couple of uh, angry old men today. <laughs> Oh, well, but thanks for having me. I mean, it was, it was first of all, it was good to see you again, and 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 I really appreciated. Well, we should we should maybe um, get together a little more often. I think so. We don't have to wait another thirteen years. Yeah, sounds good to me. All right, we will make that happen. Thank you so much for watching and listening today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter, in addition to YouTube, and of course, you can find our previous shows at my website foxvalleyvoice.com we would like to thank Drendel and Jansen's log group in Batavia for the use of their video camera and you can uh, you can hire me as a mobile DJ that's what that's another thing that I do Eric that's cool and um, you can find my mobile DJ website at seriouslyfunevents.com I had to stop and think about where do you, you play the Macarena it. if I have to I'm a big fan of the Macarena I just admitted right. that on YouTube. We, uh, we can do that off air. <laughs> Thanks for listening and watching. Make sure you're back with us this Thursday. I'm going to have in the studio Mr. Jimmy Allen of Jimmy Allen Productions. He's an extremely talented photographer and uh, filmmaker. And uh, we are going to have a lot of interesting discussions on that. Not, not that today wasn't interesting. I think he's a little less um, <laughs> censorship uh oriented <laughs> we'll talk to you next time <laughs>